Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Desert Streaming. I'm here with our friends, Katie Kamiski. Hello. And Andrew Kamiski. Hey, Andrew. Hey, how are you? <laughs> you Good. Didn't respond. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, are you, al- are you I'm alive? Bored. <laughs> I'm, I'm disengaged. So are our listeners. And distracted. Oh, so are our listeners. We've looked at our... <laughs> Double D! <laughs> I'm out of listeners. Oh, oh. We do not have an editor, so we cannot edit this out. And I don't think Marco or I know how to, we but... We barely know how to we put don't. this on the air. <laughs> Approved. Disengaged, disinterested. When Mr. Kamiski nods, we just have to stomp. Yeah. <laughs> so this is our second uh, yes, episode. Part um, two. Yep. Again, addressing the Dear Alana podcast. So if you have not listened to part one of this podcast, I would highly re- uh, recommend you listen to our first episode addressing this. Um, and again, there is a blog series uh, that is corresponding. So the, the blog series about Dear Lana, written by Andrew Kamiski, will be linked in our notes. Um, so to start this episode, um, we're going to use language for your blog. So again, read the blog first. The blog is helpful ground to our, our podcast. But in your blog, you mentioned that conversion therapy is this MacGuffin in the Dear Lana podcast, which, great, brilliant, but begs two questions. First, what is a MacGuffin? <laughs> Sounds like a, I don't know, like McDonald's <laughs> seasonal breakfast treat. So what seasonal. Is, seasonal, yeah. It's, it's autumnal like, <laughs> yeah. breakfast treat. No, like, or like autumnal, it started Day. in June. Like a MacGuffin with my yes. sham, shamrock shake. Who says a breakfast treat? <laughs> I mean, a, br- a treat true. from... Okay, if you I'm going to go get a breakfast Dude, treat. if you get breakfast from McDonald's, that is a treat. <laughs> breakfast is usually something... No, that is a treat, Marco. That should not... You should not look at it as anything but a treat. That's gluttony. That's as opposed another, to a staple. That is another sin. That's gluttony is a sin. Um, so I think that's the question. So can you define what a MacGuffin is simply? What is that yeah, term? It's a, it's a fictional device. Uh, most... Pop and a cinematic device, so Alfred Hitchcock kind of popularized yes. it, but it's more literary, I would say. So it's a plot device. It's something that shows up recurringly in a movie or a novel that connects the dots, that, that is a sort of a golden thread that runs mm-hmm. um, throughout it. It lends continuity, uh, some motion perhaps, but it actually lacks significance as to where it's all going. So in that way, it's a it's a clever, it's a clever device because it unifies what's going on, but it actually doesn't clarify, in the end, what's really happening. So it's a kind of, it's a good mysterious distraction too. Um, and my and point is, is, is the it, goal of, of MacGuffin just in movies? This is, is it to distract? Is it to sort of have the viewer, the listener, like in a Hitchcock film, like, yeah. oh, I think this one person is a murderer, but it ends up being someone else. Is the purpose of a MacGuffin to distract, or is it just simply a unifying plot device that is just not significant in the end of things? But I think can it be is tool? the. It's always the latter. It can be the okay. former too. Okay. Yeah, so that you're, you're you're thrown off a little bit by it. Yes, okay. I yeah. mean, not that, I mean, it's maybe a little relevant. So the second question is, um, how is conversion therapy, which is a term used consistently throughout the podcast, so sort of the Catholic Church leads a lot into conversion therapy, and then all these individuals are mentioned under it. Um, how is conversion therapy a MacGuffin then in this podcast? Because conversion therapy doesn't exist. Okay. So I think that that is, language is false. It's just false language. Okay, so when you say it doesn't exist, meaning like that is not an actual form of practice. No, it's not a term that Detective. any therapist uses. So there's no conversion therapist therapists. of any particular psychological school of thought. You would never go to a graduate. Well, right now, unfortunately, you'd be hard pressed to find any. excellent graduate school curriculum for for therapists in the area of of sexual identity. But uh, in regards to conversion therapy, it's become kind of the kitchen sink term for any efforts that persons uh, who uh, claim to be healers and those seeking healing uh, in the area of, of, of sexual identity. Conversion therapy would be the term that activists have used to put any, quote, change efforts, both on the part of participants and those who are helping them, would be in, conver- they're conversionists. Hmm. You're in conversion therapy. It's a catch-all term that has no, uh, no meaning 
as it relates to actual therapeutic practice. Hmm. So kind of created by <laughs> critics. Critics. Have used that term. like So the practitioner in the podcast, Alana sees uh, um, a therapist and this therapist is under, in Simon's term, is a conversion therapist. You're saying she would never have identified herself or advertised, I'm a conversion therapist. That's not language she would have ever used. No, never. And in Alana's case, I think she did go to counseling. She had counseling at her church through her youth group and then an actual therapist she saw later. Yeah, uh, all I recall, and again, forgive me if I'm wrong, I think there was a licensed helper, I don't know of what kind of credentials, licensed in the state of Colorado, who saw her for a couple of years, but we don't know what happened yes. in that counseling at yes. all. Yeah. So so we don't we don't know. But she she would not have called herself that. Um, uh, uh, Simon's therapist in New York, whom he saw for a year, maybe? I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. So. I, mean, I, think, I think it was for a year. Okay. Um, certainly knew one of the persons that he names, Joseph Nicolosi, but would never have called himself yeah. a conversion therapist. I don't even know really what that means. Conversion. What does that mean? I'm trying to convert my sexuality to Christianity. I mean, it all it kind of begs all these associations. Yes. Right, right. Like I'm trying to change myself using Christianity is mm -hmm. kind of what I what it invokes. And I've simply in 43 years of doing this ministry where I've intersected with with many therapists who come alongside of persons who are are seeking to diminish or redirect homosexual feelings. Um, have never used that. Yeah, and to be fair, Living Waters was sort of put on the under the umbrella of conversion therapy. So. Yeah, Exodus was put yes. under mm -hmm. that that I was involved with in yes. the '80s. Um, Living Waters, the 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 program, the program discipleship thing that we do was put under that umbrella. Yes. So again, kitchen sink. Right. It's actually a really poor use of language, and it's um, it's actually a kind of broad. And, and wrong way of, of seeking to discredit persons who are seeking help yeah. in their sexual identity in a way that's in line with their beliefs as Christians. And it, it defiles uh, clinicians um, who, as part of their therapeutic repertoire, are willing to come alongside of persons and help them make progress uh, in resolving homosexuality the way they want it resolved. Mm. And would you say too that there, there is just a movement, uh, I, I don't really know what, what it looked like at the beginning of the conversion therapy debate, but it seems like, it, like you said, it's a kitchen, kitchen sink, it's catching everything now. So now even the church, it seems in Simon's um, progression here in the podcast, uh, the church is the major conversion therapist. Yes, and if you go, if you become uh, uh, a turned-on Christian, uh, then beware, right. because if you're dealing with sexual issues, homosexuality, etc., um, you're there. There's gonna there's a bunch of conversion therapists who are gonna mess with your head. Right. That's the pressure that you get. Yeah, and, and not e not even just therapists, yeah. but preachers, people. I mean, anybody yeah. who's preaching the gospel right. and speaking about, you know, living a life transformed or a life yeah. beyond. You're, no, you're all... Let's put it this way. Anyone who won't lay hands on you and confirm your homosexuality is your truest, deepest, richest self is a conversion therapist. Right, exactly. And I, I, I think, I don't know. Tell me what you think. Has, is this a new development recently? Like, I, I just, I feel like at, at the beginning of this debate, it was just about what's happening in the ther in the therapeutic office. Now it's sort of broadened to priests and religious, like people who yeah. aren't even therapeutic, you know, licensed yeah. therapists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But now it's, if you preach this, you are dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Is, yeah. is, yeah. There, mm -hmm. is there something of just a natural development that's happening yeah. and we're seeing in this yeah. Podcast. I mean, most of the bills uh, throughout the country that, to ban uh, conversion therapy, uh, whether it's to minors and adults, usually it's just to minors. That only applies to the clinical realm because only clinicians, in a sense, can be punished. Sure. Uh, 
um, you know, we, the, your, your association could remove your credentials. Mm -hmm. They're aware that there are pastoral counselors that may, uh, in their own way, be practicing this. That, that becomes dangerous, though, because therapy is therapy is therapy. Right, right. Uh, I take that seriously. I have, I have counselor training. I'm not a licensed therapist, but I have a graduate degree in, in counseling. And I know what the difference is. Yeah. I know, and that one of the reasons why I didn't become a therapist is that I knew that there is something very established uh, for which I am utterly accountable when I sit across from someone and they're giving me money and maybe is going through some insurance thing and whatever the case might be, I am held to a particular standard. And so that's the case. Now, do pastoral caregivers come alongside of people for support and help in certain ways? Yes. And I would say that now some of these things that were aimed only at the professional therapeutic community, social workers, marriage and family counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, that has bled out mm -hmm. so that everyone gets lumped as a conversion therapist. Right. Well, first, I'm not doing therapy. And B, I have the good sense to know that's not my calling. That's not my capability. And so, yeah, take me out of that category altogether. Right. Um, I think the point that I make in the blog, which is, is an important one, is that what Simon is defining, we don't really know about Al Alana. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to say that, that she was troubled or harassed by conversion therapy, I see no evidence in what Simon gave us that she, she, she went to a therapist that was particularly helping her with X, Y, or Z. I don't know what she was doing. <laughs> Simon is very clear yeah. that he was going to a counselor who was using what I would call reparative insight. And reparative insight is based upon an ideology, a clinical ideology um, that is kind of the ongoing evolution, uh, um, clarification, uh, study of uh, a psychodynamic approach to human sexuality. So in the 20th century uh, with, with Freud and then the Neo-Freudians that came, they were always building upon their observations and their study and then someone else, like a Carl Jung, would take what Freud did and would kind of give it his, endow it with his own meaning. And that, that's the evolution of 20th century psychology uh, that started in Europe. And then that proceeded on to the end of the 20th century. And there was a woman, Elizabeth Moberly, Dr. Elizabeth Moberly, who was an Oxford development, or Cambridge rather, at Cambridge was a developmental psychologist, was doing research and was aware in her dealings with, with many men uh, there at Oxford that were dealing with homosexuality she studying a psychodynamic approach to sexuality realized, oh, we're not getting something here. Hmm. We're not dealing with what's actually going on with this, these men. And that had to do with these men are actually disintegrated at the level of their relationship with the masculine. Whereas Freud and Jung had focused a little bit more on the boy's psychic conflict with mother, with then becoming women, uh, Moberly said, no, the problem is actually developmentally more in regards to the same sex parent. That was a new focus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she wrote about this uh, in several really excellent books, drawing upon all of this research from the 20th century. That's what she did. She was a researcher at Oxford. This is not Cambridge. Cambridge. I'm Cambridge. I'm sorry. This is this is this is a high end right. thinker. Joseph Nicolosi was a psychologist. Went to a great school of clinical thought, PhD in psychology in Los Angeles. Catholic man. Who took Elizabeth Moberly's work and actually took this the, what she conceptualized as as a reparative understanding that the 
the preteen teen, male teens experience of same sex attraction was a reparative drive. There was an energy driving his longing for the masculine. Quite by, just interrupt by yes, reparative. Sorry. No, no, no. Just yeah. to clear, like by saying it's reparative, is that meaning it is something that can be repaired? Like, is yeah. that why, why they use the term reparative therapy? That yes, this or it's yes, longing not, can be repaired. I just really yeah, don't know no, the language. More, of, it would be more in the direction of the longing itself is an effort to repair, to take hold of what I don't so have. So the same-sex attraction is a reparative... Is a reparative drive. T- to reconcile with the same yes. gender parent, you're repairing yes. it through yes. same-sex romantic relationships. Exactly, okay, that's... yes. And so and... She, she's saying, so, so, so your heart is telling you something truthful about yourself, but interpreting it as an adult sexual quest for homoerotic romantic love homo emotional love too is actually not going to satisfy it Mm -hmm. let's dial it down and get at what's actually ailing you so joseph nicolosi took that and put it into practice okay and that became reparative therapy which so then to clarify for our listeners we're saying conversion therapy is not actually a real term it doesn't it's not a practice but reparative therapy, which uh, Simon uses those terms interchangeably. He doesn't yes. distinguish. Yes. Reparative therapy is a valid form of therapeutic practice that yes. people are practicing. Yes, yes. It's been so maligned yeah. that people have are. been <laughs> yes, discouraged, unfortunately. But Joseph Nicolosi did an amazing work. His son, who's still alive and well, Joseph is senior has died but his son is amazing joseph nicolosi jr yes who's great and we just saw him at the catholic therapeutic yeah, uh national gathering and he was he was most excellent uh in giving people an opportunity to say i i i want to look at my same-sex attraction and understand what's going on with it mm-hmm. now i dare say it's not the only thing going on with same-sex attraction so i also don't want to be reductionistic yeah, and right. say every person especially right. every man and every woman who has same-sex attraction is experiencing only from this ideological model but i think it's a very helpful model it certainly was extremely helpful to me somewhat in the therapeutic relationship I had a couple of therapists that I worked with but it wasn't mostly that it was simply understanding simply that my same-sex attraction is a window to a deeper need a deeper conflict uh, in relationship to father and male authority in my life and I can work on that Hmm. so when I when I have same-sex attractions which I do I can read those properly and say what am I going to do about that I'm not going to hate myself. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come under false shame. Um, I'm going to make uh, some reasonable decisions uh, as to pursuing deeper healing and reconciliation with my masculinity um, and also going forward to take hold of what I didn't adequately take hold of at, at formative fa- phases of my life. And that are good, healthy, life affirming relationships with other men. That's in a nutshell what this reparative understanding and guidance is. Um, And I dare say pastoral caregivers Mm -hmm. can understand that. Priests can understand that. Not that they're prescribing it heavy handedly, I hope. It's a very simple understanding that simply opens doors and windows in a person's psyche and spirit to say, actually, I can I can interpret my homosexuality differently. In other words, I don't just have to come out and say, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I am dealing with this. My feelings are telling me something important Mm -hmm. that I need to deal with. But it's not wise or moral for me to identify with those feelings as my true self and to form a, a coterie of relationships with sexually active people who believe just the same. Yeah, that's not probably the best idea for my health and happiness. Yeah. And in that way, I would say the church's guidelines on chastity uh, actually are, are well tailored mm. uh, for, for having a reparative understanding. 
or at least including that in a possibility of a way of understanding one same-sex attraction. I agree with you, Andrew. And it, even the catechism, it says like the, the psychological genesis of, of homosexuality is largely unknown. I think the catechism is being quite modest in that because yeah. there has been so much research, you know? And when I think of these thinkers like Elizabeth Moberly and Joseph Nicolosi, and you read these thinkers, they're exactly what you're saying. It's not coercive. It's not, you know, let's completely eradicate same-sex attraction out of your life. It's yes. reading, what, what it, is this symptomatic or is this destiny? Uh, if it's symptomatic, I can respond according to good human Christian behavior yes. and live in accord with my an anthropology, live in accord with my yes. true orientation. Yes. So it's funny, as you say all of that, I was doing a podcast with a couple of guys who are sort of, quote, gay Christians. And when I mentioned Elizabeth Moberly and Joseph Nicolosi, those are just bad words. They're yes. sort of villains to human flourishing. Yes. And it's so, I, I don't get it. I don't get it either. I don't really, when you read their source, when you read them, their yeah. voice, in their voice. Yeah. It's not that at all. No, it's not that. It's not, they're, they're not even, they're not even speaking morally right <laughs> they're not speaking as moral theologians they're not speaking as 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 pastoral practitioners uh, they're simply saying uh, this is our understanding of an aspect of 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 uh, human sexuality yeah a developmental understanding of human sexuality and uh, we we can say this is not an absolute science this is not uh, one size fits all. This is not, um, we have the last word. And I think that always becomes, not only I think is that diminishing of homosexualities, different reasons why people have a same sex attraction mm -hmm. because of toxic opposite sex, early relationships, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, and, and a loving, older person whose arms are safe with a good sens sensual bond. Mm -hmm. You know, Lisa Diamond, psychologist researcher Lisa Diamond has shown that women are far more inclined to love the one they're with. Mm -hmm. And if there's been a handful of toxic male relationships and they're, they're open to sexual love and there's an outreaching woman who is nurturing and attuned and verbal mm -hmm. and present... I'm, I have the capacity to become aroused with you. Yeah. And we've all known, you know, right. wonderful yeah. Christian women uh, that, that have sought refuge in the arms of other women, uh, unfortunately, but understandably. Yeah. Um, and so I'm not, one size does not fit all, but that there is a core developmental truth that when there is a breakdown in identification with key reflectors and formators of our young sexual selves, that when that's fractured for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I think we need to say there can be profound and delicate and difficult to get at reasons as to why we, we say, stop, I am not going to be like you and I am not proceeding on this path of identification. That is utterly valid. Right. And to me, that's gold today as we're looking at sort of the sexual meltdown, the disidentification with our biological selves and what, in a sense, is the psychological stuff behind that. I think a reparative approach gives us keys. And Elizabeth Moberly and Joseph Nicolosi focused solely on homosexuality in men. Yes. So for, for Simon to sort of compare himself to Alana in his experience of same-sex attraction is is reducing it to some sort of like simple yeah it's a misapplication misapplication rather of, of his story yeah enough said i i just think uh, it it's probably helpful to the listener that these thinkers solely focused on men there are studies that yes. focus on on uh, homosexuality in 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 women yes. right and so i yes. mean it enough to say that there's differences yes. between the two yes and i think it's helpful to maybe talk about sort of language used both in the podcast and then language we, we would use, uh, um, you know, as, as, as Christians, um, as Catholics. Um, and so just sort of define some terms, I think just basically, could you just briefly just define when we talk about chastity, the church teaching on chastity, that's a, 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 
a term used often, um, especially for non-Catholic listeners. Chastity may mean something quite different. So just sort of define our terms. When you say chastity, what do you mean by that? Yeah, let Marco start and I'll, oh, I'll carry okay, on. Marco, what yeah, is so chastity? I think chastity, when, when the Catholic Church speaks of it, it's, it's really integration. We love that word here at Desert Stream, integrating as the spiritual and, and biological person that I am. I have a body and I have an inner life. And when, when those are unified, when those are integrated, when those are in right relationship with each other, it's there that I can be a, a chaste being. I'm, I'm, I'm integrated on every level of my, of my personhood, which is a sexual reality. I'm always masculine in my personhood. I'm always... Uh, uh, a man, uh, even if I'm, you know, maybe a, a more attuned or, or, or sympathetic, whatever, I'm always acting as man. And so chastity, I think at a very, very root level is, is, is finding a reconciliation to who I am in my body and, and, and relating that in, in, in my inner life, in my thought life, in my spiritual life. So I like that language of integration and chastity because it's always about becoming who I am and that I don't have to find outside of myself who I am. It's there, there's something uh, of our bodies that are a window to that. Yeah. And so chastity is this lifelong plan of constantly being, uh, trying, striving to, to be in right relationship with the good of, of who I am sexually speaking. And yeah. then, so then what about homosexuality would be unchaste would you yeah. would you say that all homosexuality uh not not a, not temptations or attractions but why is acting out homosexuality yeah. is that inherently unchaste well, and I, why i, I, I would so? i would say acting out homosexuality is uh against our nature it's it's against who i am as man that i have a body i have a uh, I have male genitalia, meaning that I'm made for woman. And there's something about my chaste becoming that I have to be reconciled to that fact. So finding solace and acting out homosexually, it, I would see that as a, as a compulsion against chastity. It's trying to, to find fulfillment in the same when in fact the, my fulfillment is in the other. And I don't... Yeah, yeah. Simply put, and and, and I think to I even it. to even broaden that, yes, clearly that. But to broaden that, um, I ch being chaste. What I love about chastity is that it's the kind of the glory of becoming self-controlled. Mm. And I say that as someone who comes out of such an addictive and compulsive background the dignity of reclaiming my choice mm. and saying, no, if I'm actually going to grow in love with you, uh, let's say as a person with same-sex attraction, if I'm going to grow in love with you, my friend, my roommate, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep you out of my erotic imagination. Mm. I'm not going to make you a player. Yeah. I'm not going to treat you unchastely. I'm not going to seek from you what, what will not engender life mm -hmm. in our relationship. And back to Marco's point, the Catholic Church says what engenders life is a man and woman in a lifelong communion. And that the, the contract, the covenant is sealed through our bodies coming together. And, and, and thus, I'm not free to give my body to anyone other than my opposite sex spouse, but what chastity invites us into is, but you can still love well. Mm -hmm. And in a way you can love better because you're growing beyond the lie that, well, I have to show you my naked body or I need to take hold of your naked body in order for us to connect. Chastity says no, mm -hmm. but love boldly, mm -hmm. love freely but love with self-control. Now, that's a, that's a hard ask <laughs> in today's culture where it's like everything is going against that. I would say much more than just like, oh, don't come out of the closet right. or whatever. Everything is just about, oh, well, you know, if you just, 
I mean, we're inundated. Yeah. Oh, they're together now. Oh, there's that couple. There's, you know, it's mostly opposite gender. Yeah. Unchastity. Absolutely. But it's just all about, well, I'm, of course we're having sex. Of right. course. And it's like, well, that's not very loving. It's, you're taking something that is not yours. And I think we've lost that. Mm. And so when I think of chastity, it, it, it certainly includes keys for homosexual strugglers being reconciled to the good of their bodies, the good of their, their, their purpose and dignity as male or female, hmm. despite sometimes deep feelings otherwise. But in the bigger picture of how I relate to people, chastity gives me the power to love well by mm. exercising self-control. And I love that. And I think for people that are maybe a little shut down sexually, that don't have much desire or longing and even find other people threatening or toxic mm. in their bodies, I think we have to say, stir it up. Yeah, right. <laughs> you need to stir it up. Yeah. You need to reclaim the color of your amazing, beautiful, sexuality as woman mm -hmm. as man now we can be modest we need to be modest but we can be motivated out of the beauty and the appeal of other human beings we just get to do so with this great gift of self-control hmm. which is for the other's good yeah. and so that's what i love about chastity yeah, beautiful. more and more and so yeah, yeah so chastity i think and many people i mean you have chastity felt it connotes repression um yeah. and so you're you're saying no it's so freeing it's actually it's, freeing. it's freedom not repression yeah and so reparative therapy for certain individuals by no means all could be one of the means of becoming more chaste yeah so reparative it's, it's, therapy it's, it's, it's helpful is helpful for yeah. those with certain yeah. brokenness seeking to become chaste reparative therapy can be helpful there yeah, absolutely and i think especially for those who deal with inordinate shame yes. and so oh well, why do i have these feelings what's wrong with me what's going on to say no like lord thank you you know yeah you know why i feel this I, this brings me no great pleasure sure. to have to bring this up again but i bring it up lord so that the light of your wisdom the light of your church the light of of caring people caring chaste people in my life what a great gift to have caring chaste people with whom you can share your mixtures, yes. your adulteries, yeah, right. your quiet little adulteries that to the scrupulous soul become amplified, yes. yeah. become hammers against them. That's the, that's the darkness. Yeah. That's what we, we need to rebuke the accuser Amen. as much as we say, oh God, sorry, I'm so whacked out with all my attractions you yeah. Know? yeah you know like you know the the californians you know katie and i are from california <laughs> where it's just like we're so un, we've been so uncovered our whole life you know but if it's a little more scrupulosity oh it's like oh i can't you know it's like no that's that's where the integration comes yeah. in and that's where we can talk about this in the next podcast how do we identify that scrupulosity, the inordinate shame and yes, self-hatred, yes. especially with sexual conflicts, and help people integrate, you know, come on, give yourself a break. Yeah. Giving yourself a break doesn't mean joining the gay parade yeah. or, or taking on the lover or seducing your roommate. Yeah. It means saying, you know, I, um, I don't know why, but I really, I, I want to touch my roommate. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, Lord, because yeah. that wouldn't be loving and it's not good for me. But I want to find the narrow way through this. And the church helps us. Yes. Yeah, I, I love that. We'll talk about this in the next podcast. But how to live in tension with our love for Jesus and then just kind of these inner conflicts. Yes. Uh, namely, same-sex attraction. You yes. Know? So how to live in that, in that tension and, and to find the narrow way through. Yeah, Great. Yeah. Well... Thanks for joining us. You're so welcome. Yeah, great, great, grateful to have you here, Andrew. Thanks. I'll see you soon. Yeah. Very soon. We'll see you soon. It's a small world. Yeah. Uh -huh. DSM office. I know, it's getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> we won't go into that. Yes. The spacious kingdom of our king. The grand view of Grandview, Missouri. Uh -huh. Just the kidding. Grand Less view. grand. <laughs>
Thanks for Amen. having us. God bless you.